Welcome back to Citizen Extra. Let's now take you to, or crossover rather, to County Hall where the vetting of Justice Paul Kihara is about to kick off. Uh, actually, it started. Let's uh, tune in. Let's listen in. And it will continue to be. And if I were approved by you, honorable ladies and gentlemen, to exercise the power and responsibility of the office of the Attorney General, I assure you, I would and will be bound by the constitution of this country. That office represents the people of Kenya. It is certainly not an instrument of any political party. Mr. Speaker, sir, it is the vehicle for the implementation of the constitution of Kenya for the Kenyan people from whom it derives the authority and power. Mr. Speaker, sir, I have briefly outlined the hallmarks of my career in law, and if you would grant me a little indulgence, I would like to take you through a glimpse of my childhood, which I think will help you understand my person and the foundations upon which I have built and the way I live. I was raised in a home of a bishop of the Anglican Church by my dear mother, Lillian Waidimu, who was a steadfast founder and member of the Mother's Union in her time and one of the noblest and most hardworking people I know. My father, the Right Reverend Obadiah Kariuki, whose service began in the Diocese of Mombasa soon after I, I was born, and who retired as Bishop of the Diocese of Mount Kenneth South. I was the youngest of 11 children. That meant that I long learned to wait for others to speak before I spoke, to listen to several voices all at the same time, and to ask for help when I was stuck. Growing up with parents who were deeply rooted in the religious life of rural Kenyans put me in touch at a very early age with the needs of what I know to be a deeply spiritual nation. A people who believe very strongly in the value of pulling together, of defending what is right, and of allowing for the providence of the Almighty God. The important thing here, Mr. Speaker, sir, is not the religious denomination in which I was raised, but that I was raised to value Kenyans as believers of the value and truth of justice. This spirit is characteristic. Actually, it, it's a bond. It runs through this entire nation from east to west, from north to south, male and female, literal and illiterate, rich or poor, and I stand by that value, Mr. Speaker, sir. I also stand by the lessons that I learned from my father as I observed him lead his diocese. He was a passionate man, he was a very compassionate man who believed in justice and he chose the path of integrity. The utmost faith, faith and fear in God, courage, compassion, collegiality, and conviction were the guiding lights of that man who was my father. And I, Mr. Speaker, sir, have made them my guiding lights too. Apart from the rigors of the Anglican Church, there is something else that I grew up in, something that gave me another valuable opportunity to learn how to understand communities and cultures. Repertory theater or performance theater. I have performed in tons of plays from primary school through secondary school and also during my years at the University of Nairobi. 
But even after that, Mr. Speaker, sir, when I worked as a lawyer in private practice, I still made it my duty to learn my lines, to audition, to rehearse, and to be molded by directors and my fellow cast members alike, and to perform regularly at one of the theatres in Nairobi at the time, Phoenix. Theatrical performance, Mr. Speaker, sir, is an art of getting into someone else's skin, walking around and feeling in it. And even though I haven't in recent years performed much, I remain deeply committed to the arts and to their eye-opening capacity. Theatre has always brought me clarity over questions of human nature while my upbringing in the church and my career as an officer of the court in various capacities has an entailed understanding people so as to untangle their controversies and provide sure path. Mr. Speaker, sir, this is a very defining moment for me in my career and in my personal life. In many ways, I owe this moment to those who have worked so selfishly over the years and those who have supported me on the path that has brought me this far. My sister and brother judges of the High Court and the Court of Appeal, my professional colleagues at the bar, my associations with the church and through and at that time with many members of this august house, some still serving, some who have fallen by the wayside through elections. And that put me in a very privileged position and it helped me network across the board with people of different communities different religions, different walks of life. It is impossible to name them all here. But I must mention my dear wife, Sarah, who I first met, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, at a festival when we were both playing sheep in a play entitled The Play of the Shepherd. Well, since we got married over 40 years ago, she has not been a sheep. She has been my strongest pillar. Her love is unswavering. Her support is consistent and abundant. An achiever in her, in her own right, Mrs. Kariuki's brilliance, insights, wisdom and unconditional love have all helped to raise our three children, all of whom are now adults, and who continue to make us proud every day. Our three grandchildren give us so many moments of sheer delight, Mr. Speaker, sir. Except when they're putting out air in my tires on the government issue of my Prado. They're a constant reminder, Mr. Speaker, of the burden that I bear for the next generation. Indeed, my role as a grandfather adds to my commitment to be a trustworthy leader for the next generation. A trustee who will deliver to posterity a robust framework to accommodate <coughs> diversity of opinion, to address the difference in social economic status, to protect and provide for differences in heritage, belief, and culture. In other words, Mr. Speaker, sir, to deliver a Kenya for all people. And when I talk of difference, I know firsthand what it means because I have been myself a beneficiary of the understanding of other people. I should like at this juncture, honorable ladies and gentlemen,
to acknowledge and remember in thanksgiving a lady called Glory Hagberg, who has passed away some years now. She was my teacher in primary school, a predominantly European school at a time when many people were still reluctant to let go of the barriers of colonialism and some places which did not have room for people like myself, who spoke a different language, who ate different foods, who lived along muddy paths. This lady, Mr. Ch Chairman, sir, she saw, she noticed me. This young boy who had very little self-esteem, who could barely speak up, who did not have properly packed lunch, and who could not sit and eat with other children with much confidence. And slowly she found ways to encourage me, to persuade me that though I was different, I was worthy. Often she packed lunch specially for me, and her encouragement, kindness, and generosity helped me transform myself into a, from a self-conscious, unsure individual to a confident Kenyan, one who believed that different is not a curse, but a blessing. And over the years since, Mr. Speaker, sir, I've been able to draw from that experience at a very early age to extend a hand of brotherhood and fellowship and love to those I have trained over the years. You've asked me, Mr. Speaker, sir, for what my vision is and what I will do if this august house is gracious enough to confirm me to this position, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But let me conclude this by making a final observation. Mr. Speaker, sir, I've been privileged to be a judge for just over 15 years. And during my term of service, I've always used the immense powers of that office to ensure that justice is served. Being a judge has often exposed me to pressures and differences of with the arms of government, and to return, I've acted within the framework of the Constitution of Kenya. I have no doubt that the daily ritual of the, of the attorney general includes making decisions, some of which may involve agreeing with the executive or with the legislature. Indeed, with my colleagues, the However, these things of checks and balances, coupled with the interdependence by the Constitution and show that none of these arms oversteps their boundaries. It is in a very privileged position, right in the middle of that or as umpire. And should I occupy that position, hopefully, and the entire of goodwill amongst all, even when they differ, Mr. Chairman, sir, and especially when there are differences. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, if you confirm me to be the Attorney General, I pledge to lead from the front and from by example, guided by the Constitution and the rule of law. Since my nomination, I have received so many messages of goodwill and support, so much compassionate advice from a broad cross-section of my fellow Kenyans, and I have been humbled by the messages that I have so received from so many different people of different walks of life. We, the Kenyan people, may belong to different ethnicities. 
We may worship differently and even be of different political persuasions, but whatever I think of our multiple and different identities, Mr. Speaker, I am reminded of the flowers of a garden. When you look at flowers in a garden, Mr. Speaker, sir, they're all different. They carry different fragrances. They have different colors and different petals. But aren't we all struck by the beauty and the variety they bring to each one of us? As Kenyans, Mr. Speaker, sir, we must strive to see the beauty in each other, even when we are different. We must use each other's strengths for the common good. And if this august house confirms that I should be independent Kenya's several seventh attorney general, I will fiercely play that part of ensuring that we blossom to a truly beauty of nationhood. I will serve with honor. I will uphold the great trust placed upon me. I will be informed by the law always in every decision I make so that the Constitution will be held and upheld. This is my pledge to you, Mr. Speaker, sir, and this August House. And it is my pledge to the people of this great country. Mr. Speaker, if I could now perhaps deal with uh, the questions you posed. And you mentioned in the event that this August House were to confirm my nomination, how would I use my position as Attorney General to enforce, to realize, is, is perhaps the word, Vision 2030 and the Great Four. Mr. Speaker, sir, everything hinges on our Constitution. And the various articles in the Constitution, Article 10, of how public servants sh should behave, our county governments, our parastatals, <clears throat> and so forth. That is the fulcrum, that is the basis. But what we find, we find, for instance, that because our laws are perhaps not adequately enforced, we are not able to realize the fruits that we endeavor to see. I'll take the example of corruption. The Department of Justice is the bedrock to drive the war against corruption. I would see the Office of the Attorney General, General to be the focus to convene the various other stakeholders, the Office of the DPP, the Criminal Investigation, the, anti, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, so that any teething problems that there have been of accusations of one against the other as to how they should work, those would be ironed out. Could you remind me, perhaps, uh, Mr. Speaker, of your second aspect, if you do not mind? How the Office of the Attorney General, if we are to be confirmed, would play its, uh, its part in ensuring that, um, in the medium, medium term, the um, Agenda 4 blueprints are achieved of um, universal health care, cheap housing, 
manufacturing and uh, food security. Thank you for that question, Mr. Speaker, sir. The starting point is to create an enabling environment. Because without an enabling environment, none of those pillars can be achieved. The Office of the Attorney General would look at whether our current legislation is adequate, whether we need to fi fine-tune it to bring it in conformity with that vision. That would require coordination between this August House, which is the legislative arm. It would also require coordination and dialogue with the judiciary, as well as the executive itself. Apart from the law, we would have to look at what, de de what devils or bedevils us most. The chambers of the Attorney General currently, we have several cases where, or which are evident, of incapacities of various natures in personnel, in adequate training of that personnel, in even the basics of these tools that are required to enable them work. So I would build and enhance the capacity both in terms of the bodies that are there as well as their skills so that the various services that are rendered by that office, the legal advice that is given to ministries, that is given to government, the coordination with the county government, that that advice would be sound. That would reduce the number of cases or contracts which are badly handled which have hitherto been um, part of the main reason why government has been losing so much money. Very well. <coughs> I'll uh, open the session to other members um, of the committee. I see leader majority. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and the Chair of the Session. And uh, welcome, uh, Judge uh, Kihara, to this session. I have uh, three questions. And the last question I will ask if you have a copy of the Constitution uh, to have it. But my first question is that the justice system in our country has come of age. The spirit of the Constitution that was proclamated is that of clear separation of powers between the three arms of government. Prior to your appointment, you were serving as the President of the Court of Appeal in that arm of government known as the judiciary. If you are appointed to serve as the Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya, you will be serving in the executive. How will you ensure, as my question, how will you ensure complementarity of those three arms of government and still uphold the separation of powers? My second question is that if you are confirmed by the House and appointed by the President, you will become an automatic member of the Judicial Service Commission. And there are reports that there is a subcommittee of the Judicial Service Commission that is investigating you on the matter of the appointment of the returning officers by IBC 
a decision that was made by the Court of Appeal, uh, comprising of Judge Gidinji, Judge Mother Kome, and Judge Fatuma Sichale. And a complaint was filed, and that was just before the repeat elections. How do you deal with that? My last and final question, on which I have asked you that you need to have a copy of the Constitution, which I want to refer to. I want to, I want to start with the Article 252 of the Constitution. And Article 250 of the Constitution, sub Article 2, It says, 250 sub article 2. It says that the chairperson and each member of a commission and holder of an independent office shall be a identified and recommended to for appointment in a manner prescribed by the national legislation. B approved by the National Assembly. And C appointed by the president, and he says, all commissions and independent officers. And in my opinion, the Judicial Service Commission falls within the reading of that article. It's a commission, and its nominees, apart, in my opinion, apart from the Chief Justice, or the Deputy Chief Justice, or whoever represents the, the Supreme Court or the AG, who ideally are approved by the House when they are getting those positions, the rest of the other members of the Judicial Service Commission, like any other member, must be subjected to parliamentary vetting and approval. And I was a member of the 10th Parliament. And in the 10th Parliament, and the report of this House and the Hansard will bear me out, in the 10th Parliament, under the new Constitution, the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee then, chaired by the Honorable Ababu Namwamba, vetted five people. And out of the five people, there was Judge Justice Riaga Omolo who was a representative of the Judicial Service Commission then. Of course, the others who were uh, vetted were the representative of the LSK, Senior Counsel Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi, Flores Mwangangi, there was Mr. Gatere of Public Service Commission, and of course the two other nominees that represent the public interest. But when it came to the 11th parliament, your predecessor, and then, and also the then Chief Justice, did not submit the names of the nominees from LSK, from the High Court, from the Court of Appeal, from the Magistrates Court, to parliament for vetting. The article they're using, in my opinion, for not presenting those names, is Article 171, sub Article 2, which talks about the commission shall consist of. Justice Kiara, as a chief legal advisor, what is your interpretation? And which one is supreme between Article 250, sub Article 2, and Article 171, sub Article 2? And finally, during, your, during the, your predecessor's time, 
the last five years of the President Uhuru Kenyatta's administration, the relationship between the judiciary and the executive was not one of its best, was not very rosy. And then, and, and you being uh, the president of the Court of Appeal, what can you tell this committee was the cause? Was it a failure on the part of your predecessor in communicating with the other arm of government, which is the judiciary? Was it on the part of the judiciary, which you are part of? That, the last question is just an opinion, because uh, government and the judiciary in the last five years, six years, had a number of wars. And the, in, in my opinion, the Constitution has provided this office under Article 156 to be the bridge between the legislature and the executive. And because I, as the leader of majority, and I'm sure the speaker will agree and the colleagues, all the bills, to, government bills that comes to government, to parliament comes through you. You are the bridge between the, the, the executive and the legislature. You are the bridge between the, leg, the executive and the judiciary. What happened, in your opinion? Did uh, Professor Gideon Mugai failed uh, in his duties to make sure that uh, he communicates well, uh, not only to the judiciary, maybe to the Court of Appeal? Because even the uh, Court of Appeal had issues with government. Government was losing cases. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> Maybe if, if, if we're not going to ask too many questions, then uh, we, we can either have him <coughs> respond to those because it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, then we can get uh, the leader of the minority party also to, to ask you. We could respond to those uh, from the Honorable Duale. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Speaker, sir, I will answer, and thank you too, uh, Honorable Dwyer, for the questions. The first one is related to the last, in as much as it, it's with regard to the separation of powers. And it's true that in the recent past, there has, this, there has developed this unpleasant or unhealthy um, debate which has gone into the public forum. And I should perhaps begin by saying that there can be no question, Mr. Speaker, sir, that an order of the court must be obeyed. That is the starting point. But having said that, there has also been a debate creating continued suspicion between the three arms of government and especially between the executive and the judiciary. And it is important for the judiciary to ensure that in executing its constitutional mandate, it does so in accordance with the Constitution and the rule of law. Because the minute any arm of government begins to question the credibility or the validity of a court order, then we are in a state of seeming anarchy. There is no such thing, honorable members, as absolute separation of powers or absolute independence of any one or more of the arms of government. Your duty, Mr. Speaker, sir, in this august house is to render services to the people of this nation. That is the bottom line. And you cannot do it independently of the executive or independently of the judiciary. 
any more than any one of those arms can do the same. We have to work together. And we have to talk to one another. Because that is the only way that we can give life to this document that binds us, each one of us, individually and collectively. I agree with you on Mahashmi Ondwale that the Office of the Attorney General is in that very privileged position where it can dialogue and interact with those three arms and bring them together. We have had instances when you, Mr. Speaker, sir, have complained that the judiciary has encroached on your territory, that you've been unable to conduct the business of the House because of a court order. That equally should never be the case, in my very humble opinion. We in the judiciary have complained that there have been encroachments either by Bunge or by the executive. The tension that exists or should exist between three, these three arms is a healthy one. And it should be encouraged so that we have the checks and balances to which I referred earlier. But when it gets to the point where one arm is being disabled by another, that is not the intent, nor the spirit, nor the letter of this great instrument here. So if you're gracious enough to confirm my position, I will make it my personal business to ensure that the three arms work in harmony. So that they work interdependently even as they continue to retain their independence. The second issue that you have raised, Honorable Dwale, is as regards this petition that was filed against me and my three colleagues in the Court of Appeal. And I should like to say first, Mr. Speaker, sir, that I believe in due process. I believe in the rule of law. I was requested by the Judicial Service Commission to answer to that petition. I have done so. It is now in the hands of the Judicial Service Commission and I await to hear from the Commission as to what their verdict on my innocence or otherwise would be. With profound respect to Muheshmi Wandwale, I don't think it would be proper for me to discuss this at this house and with all due re reverence to you Mr. Speaker and the honorable members because that would appear to be preempting what the Judicial Service Commission might have to say. It would also perhaps prejudice the pending petitions of my two sister judges and my brother, Justice Gedenji, whom you mentioned. And I would not want to venture into that. All I can say is that I acted in accordance with the law. The Court of Appeal Administration Act is quite clear as to the powers of the President of the Court of Appeal. And those of you who are familiar with that court will remember 
that before this constitution was enacted, it was the highest court in this land, and it was presided over by the Chief Justice. But after 2010, the constitution established the Supreme Court where the Chief Justice is the president. And in an endeavor to move away from the position where the head of the judiciary had all the powers, each of the courts, the Court of Appeal, the High Court, were given a president in the case of my court and a principal judge in the case of the High Court. And their powers are expressly stipulated by a statute which this august house passed as to the administration of the court pursuant to the relevant section of the constitution as to the powers of unpaneling benches and so forth I would feel uncomfortable to say more on that subject for the reasons I have given. The Honourable Member Ndwale has also sought my advice as regards appointments to the Judicial Service Commission. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I think it would again be improper for me to comment on the performance of my predecessor, if you're gracious enough to confirm my nomination. But I will say this. Under Article 250 of the Constitution, sub-article sub 2, approved by the National Assembly, and appointed by the President. If I understand the question correctly, it seeks my opinion as to whether or not a member of the Judicial Service Commission who is not appointed by the President should come before this House for approval. Article 250, I think, should be read in conjunction with Article 248. 248 sets out the various commissions to which 250 applies. And if my reading is correct, under 248 2E, the Judicial Service Commission is expressly named. Going to the Court of Appeal Organization and Administration Act, um, a section in that Act, Section 1011, and expressly Section 12, deals with the appointment of the, by the Court of Appeal, for instance, of the member who goes to the JSC. My reading of the Constitution and that legislation is that the mode of election is a process. Some of the members of the JSC are elected by the Law Society of Kenya. Some judges, by the High Court, um, High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Magistracy. But once those bodies have elected the persons who are to serve in the JSC, then the provisions of Article 250 read in conjunction with 
the other article I've just referred to come into operation. And in my very humble opinion, Mr. Speaker, sir, before the His Excellency the President appoints those members, they would have to come before this House for approval. Because that is the only way that the public, through yourselves, would have an opportunity of vetting the person who is nominated. As you are now doing with me, I have been nominated by the President, but I am before this august house. And through yourselves, the millions of Kenyans who are out there to ensure that the President's choice is the people's choice. That would be my answer to that. As to why it didn't happen at any particular, I have not been a member of the JSC, I cannot speak to that. Well, well I'm seeing uh, the leader of my minority on this side, Honorable John Bundy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, our speaker for giving me this opportunity also to ask uh, three or so questions. Uh, first, uh, let me take this opportunity to congratulate you, uh, Justice uh, Paul uh, Kariuki, uh, for being nominated by the President uh, to be the second, I think, under the new constitution, AG, under the new constitution, uh, who has been nominated under the current constitution. Um, I have three questions as I've uh, indicated. Firstly, I want to start by saying that uh, my engagement with your colleagues in the legal profession and those who have worked closely with you in the judiciary and the corridors of justice uh, paint a very positive picture about you in terms of your um, intellectual capacity, your competence, uh, your management skills, and more particularly, uh, there are praises about you in terms of running uh, the Court of Appeal as the President. And uh, the talk among your colleagues, I want to uh, give you this uh, uh, feedback uh, for you to either use it positively or otherwise, is that the level of the, the, level of the court, that is the Court of Appeal, is hailed as probably the best level compared to High Court, the Supreme Court. However, there are fears. And I want to just quickly mention uh, this and uh, uh, ask for your reaction to two issues tied to that. That there are fears that you are likely to use your intellectual capacity uh, to not work in the best interest of Kenyans if you decide to. That is depending on uh, whether you decide to play politics or not. I know my colleague, uh, the leader of majority, has raised this matter, and I know the matter is under investigation, so I want to be very careful. Uh, but I want to mention that uh, a number of Kenyans, and I want to uh, remind, uh, just not remind you, because this is something you really you know, but just mention that Article 73 of the Constitution, uh, 73, 1, a4 says that the authority assigned to a state officer uh, uh, promote, is a public trust to be exercised in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity of the office and B vests in the state officer the responsibility to serve the people rather than the power to rule them. Now, I want to direct this question in terms of confidence. You are coming into the office where some people uh, need persuasion in terms of having confidence in you because of the decision you made last year. The decision that you made last year regarding after the High Court had made a determination on the, uh, on the appointment of the returning officers by IBC uh, that it was unprocedural, that the way you constituted the bench by bringing people from outside Nairobi and constituting it to sit at odd hours that there is likelihood that you are not influenced by uh, the professionalism 
but may be political interest to sanitize uh, the incompetence of IBC at that time. I know this matter is actually under investigation, but again, investigations, you know, I know the Judicial Service Commission goes through their investigation and t take it, recommends a tribunal, and uh, this, the law of subjudice does not arise here. So maybe you will choose how to address it, but just how do you give, get back the confidence of those Kenyans who feel that probably you have used your very, very good intellectual capacity that many Kenyans who know you are talking about so positively uh, to serve political interest. Tied to that question is the fact that you are going to be the chief legal advisor to the executive, to the government actually, not just the executive, the government. And your predecessor, and with all due respect to him, uh, we have uh, Kenyans have questioned the advice that probably has been offering uh, the uh, government in a number of issues that have come up. How are you going to assure us that uh, we are going to see a difference? I know you have mentioned previously that you don't want to discuss your predecessor, and I think it is just fair and just uh, to do that, not to do that. Uh, but you can give Kenyans, because you are, this is a public office and you are going to hold it in trust on behalf of the people of Kenya. So you have a duty to give us that confidence. Finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am sure Justice is aware that uh, his office and that of the Solicitor General have had issues, long-running uh, differences. Uh, stemming from the time when Amos Wako was occupying that office to the time that uh, Gidu Migai has occupied that office. The Solicitor General and the Attorney General have not been working in harmony. And this has been very wasteful to us as a people in terms of resources. Because we want the state law office to work harmoniously to serve our interests as a country. What assurance would you give to this committee and to the people of Kenya that you are likely to, I, in the 100 days, what are you going to do to iron out those differences? Because when you are coming uh, here and accepting this nomination, I'm sure you'd have done your research to find out a bit of what could be causing uh, the problems that have, uh, the, the issues that have been between your office and the office of the Solicitor General. Otherwise, thank you. Wish you good luck if you are going to uh, be successful. Let, let me let me combine uh, two. Uh, let me get the deputy speaker, Honourable Cheboy. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and congratulations, uh, Justice Kihara, for being nominated. Uh, I now realize, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, why I speak too much is because of the hierarchical background in the family, speaking too fast and fast because I'm first born and he says being a last born he would speak last and I realize therefore they speak most uh, at the end because the skies will be clear but th that's not really my question I have two questions uh, the first one is uh, even listening to Justice Kihara's description of himself and comparing with what that, uh, others say about him uh, he is a man of integrity now uh, that brings this question. You were serving in an institution which requires a lot of integrity. Uh, I mean, if, if I were to be asked, the most natural position for you to occupy after this, uh, what you've been serving in for the last 15 years, is to look for an opening in the Supreme Court and exit there. It surprises me that you would want and I really wanted to ask you this question because uh, for the last few days, but I decided not to change my mind even after listening to you. Why is it that you decided that this is a position that you would be very happy with? You are in a position which has security of tenure. You are in a position which, uh, you know, politics doesn't get too entangled in. Uh, it, it surprises me, but uh, I really want to hear something from you. Uh, whether you are going even to be safe in this one, you know, the 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 days uh, chief uh, i mean uh, ag serve they serve uh, you know very brief times with a lot of controversies uh, very unlikely in the judicial i mean in the judiciary that's my first question the second one 
is uh, looking at even at the, uh, the, the the article of the constitution that creates uh, the office of the attorney general and what they are supposed to do, representing <coughs> the republic in various cases. We have not been doing very well in cases, especially in the international courts. And the specific example is uh, the Kenya-Somali case, where we are having a problem with the boundary. And we have already lost uh, some preliminary issue in that particular uh, court. Um, now, and others, anglo leasing is another one. We have been losing cases. There is even another one which uh, touches actually on my own particular constituency in the regional court in, in Arusha where a whole swath of land is declared that the titles will not be very useful uh, to the owners of those titles. No problem when uh, Kenyans go to the regional courts, but when an order comes out of such a regional court and deals with areas even that were not canvassed, it, it becomes an issue. What is it that you are likely to do if you are confirmed to make sure that uh, the position of Kenya uh, in those courts are well taken care of because my opinion is we, we've not been doing very well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's allow him to, to respond to those two. The, from Honorable John Bandy and the Honorable Cheboy. Let, let him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. And I thank the two honorable members for um, asking those questions. <laughs> there is a fear that I will use my intellect. There's not much of it left, as you can see, with my bald head. <laughs> um, on a serious note, Mr. Speaker, sir, as I said earlier, I have been brought up in a tradition of the values and virtues of integrity, of courage, of honesty, and so on. Throughout my life, as a legal practitioner at the bar, as well as the short stint I had at the Kenya School of Law and for the last 16 years as a judge. And that is not to say, Mr. Speaker, sir, that I have not been at times under tremendous pressure from honorable members of this august house, some of whom went to school with me, some of whom have occupied very high offices in this country, from the executive, from family, and so on. In the five years that I have been the President of the Court of Appeal, I have empaneled thousands of benches to hear matters. And not once Mr. Speaker, sir, have I ever been accused of having done it underhandedly? Not once in 16 years have I ever been accused of taking a bribe or for delivering a judgment which was either incompetent or would appear on the face of it to have been influenced by any other reason other than justice. So to put your mind at rest, honorable member, and those Kenyans who may share that apprehension, nothing could be further from the truth. My strength comes from the experience, the varied experience and my conviction 
that justice must be for all. When I served as the Chancellor of the Church of the Province of Kenya, now the Anglican Church, it was at a time just before in the 90s, and I served for 23 years. And it was at a, a very difficult time when there was the huge debate whether we should change the constitution to allow multi-party politics to enter. And I was under tremendous pressure from the political circles of the time. But the advice I rendered to the Archbishop and to the bishops and to the church in general still stands. My job as legal advisor is to be truthful. Whether or not that advice is accepted and taken is quite another thing. But I will not, I will not bend from what the Constitution and the law require me to do. Not for this position, not for any position. I grew up at a time, Mr. Speaker, when I had great opportunity to become a very, very wealthy man. I had the best connections. I didn't take that as an opportunity. Whether it was my association with the church, whether it was as a member of the bar in a very successful legal practice, whether it is subsequently as a judge, I have stood my ground. And I can say without any fear of any contradiction that I will continue on that path. That partly answers your question, sir. Because when a nation calls me to serve, And when I left private practice, Mr. Speaker, sir, I was making some pretty good money. I was in a firm, the largest firm of its time, the largest firm in Kenya at the time. But after practicing at the bar for some 27 years, I started getting restless and a voice and I don't want to go into religion now but I felt it was time for me to serve my country and I was asked to be the principal of the Kenya School of Law and barely before I was I had begun I was invited to be judge and I resisted it because I felt at the time I needed to do some work at the Kenya School of Law. But I lost that little battle and I went to the judiciary. And now I have been asked by His Excellency the President to serve in the capacity of the Attorney General. And it is my humble plea that this august house will approve that nomination so that I can truly answer to that call. I didn't apply for the job, but I have been asked to serve Kenyans. And if I am asked to serve Kenyans, I will do so to the best of my ability. Yes. I am very much alive to the fact that there will be pressure. 
but I have endured pressure. I have endured pressure as a judicial officer. You know, Muheshmiwa, you go to church on a Sunday, and as you're walking out the west door, shaking people's hands, your own priest embraces you and says, Na ukumbuke yule ni mutu wetu. Referring to a case before me. I hear the words, but they go straight through and out the other year. I'm not about to begin. Be assured of that. Not now, not at any time in the future. We have a job, honorable ladies and gentlemen. You remember, for those of you, I refer to my days of theater, for those of you who are familiar with plays, you remember that moment in Robert Bort's play, A Man for All Seasons which is about a chancellor like the one who hopefully you will graciously approve and he says drawing from the gospel of Luke what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul that is a challenge for, for all of us, not just me. Not just me. It's for every member of any institution in this country who holds a position of leadership. Members of parliament, MCAs, m members of boards of directors, whatever and however you serve, it's all here. It's all here. That's where it starts. That's where it ends. And for some of us, speaking for myself, there is a higher authority than this, which is my God Almighty. That is to how to change this country. That's what we need to do. Getting honest men and women to answer calls to serve their country with honor, with dignity, with honesty, with passion, Mr. Speaker. That is what is required. And if you listen to too much noise with profound respect, one loses that focus, one loses that goal. I always tell myself, ladies and gentlemen, when these distractions come, when a thought of war comes to you, you must defeat it with a stronger thought of love. And when a thought of hatred comes, you defeat it with a stronger thought of peace. That to me is what it's about. That's why I spoke about my grandchildren. Because I owe them. Not just my own, but the thousands and millions of others who are not my flesh and blood, but who are my grandchildren in this country. I stand for them. And I will deliver if you give me the chance to do so.
section 156, article 156. Solicitor General and the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, sir, Article 156, establishing the Office of the Attorney General, and then the Office of the Attorney General Act, which spells out very clearly the respective powers and obligations of this, these two offices. And I agree it's unfortunate that there has been that debate that has spilled to the public arena. I have already had several sessions with the Solicitor General who was sworn in, I think, the day before yesterday. And the two of us are quite agreed that if we cannot and will not work together, we would not succeed. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, sir, it would be unworthy of us to hold those positions. There is no need to fight. The Solicitor General is the accounting officer, is the authorized officer, his duties are there, spelt out in the law. My duties, if you confirm me, ladies and gentlemen, are spelt out in the law. I don't have a big ego, Mr. Chairman. I don't. I've learned through my varied experience to be humble to lead from the front and to lead by example. I have mentored many people at the bar, judges. I spent a considerable amount of time at the Judiciary Training Institute. I started it from scratch, from nothing. Mr. Speaker, sir, my first day there, I asked my God, why me? Because this was not what I asked to be. There was nothing. There wasn't even a chair. And my first, first task was to write on a little notebook that I had, that I need a, a kettle and a mug of coffee and so on. Within the first year, we were training not only Kenyan judges, but judges from other jurisdictions. And those jurisdictions still continue to come to our country. Somewhere in my court last year, from Zambia, benchmarking in the Court of Appeal. The Solicitor General is a younger man than me in years at the bar and in years on this earth. But you know, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, sir, we all work, walk on the same earth. We're all branches of the same tree. We're all equal. And I will treat him with that respect. So, to answer the question more directly, we will discharge our mandate in accordance with the provisions of the statute which this August House has passed, and with the Constitution, and with the fabric and the ritual of the law.
As regards this case, um, you know, Mahashmiwa, I have set out the circumstances in great detail of what happened and the provisions of section 9 I think it is of the Court of Appeal Organization and Administration Act but just to perhaps put your mind and please Mr. Chairman I don't think I should say any more than this there is a perception that there are several courts of appeal or that there are several high courts the high court is one with jurisdiction it sits at the various centers and so does the court of appeal which is now decentralized during the particular period to which you're referring Maheshmiwa a court vacation had just started the court in Malindi was not sitting because one of the judges was away abroad and rather than having two judges there doing nothing so to speak we brought them to Nairobi a court in Nyeri was not sitting because the presiding judge there and the two honorable judges felt that because of the atmosphere of the time with the elections being so imminent they would rather be in Nairobi and we had a duty bench at the time so when it was necessary for me to place the matter that had been filed before a bench I sought the duty bench one member of that duty bench was not traceable either by my staff or myself or indeed by the colleagues with whom he was to sit so it befell me to find somebody else having said that as I said earlier the powers of the President of the Court of Appeal are very clearly spelled out in the statute Section 13, which would be the last point I make on this subject for the reasons I alluded to, because this is a document in the public domain, it says that the President of the Court shall be the head of the Court and shall in, regard, in that regard oversee the proper management and administration of the Court. Secondly, he will be responsible for the allocation of cases and the constitution of benches, including ordinary and extraordinary benches of the court. That is the law. That is the mandate that has been given to the president. And finally, my job is administrative as president of the court I merely facilitate 
a matter to be placed before a bench. What that bench does with it is not my concern. It only becomes my concern if I am sitting as a judge with colleagues. Then I cease to be president, so to speak, and I sit as a judge. So there are three of us. But when I sit as a president and hand over a matter to the court, that is the end of my engagement. So, Ch Chairman, Speaker, Sir, I really ought not to say any more than that. There was an issue raised by the Honorable Cheboy about uh, uh, orders from um, other jurisdictions. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Shimiwa. You're quite right. There are concerns, both as relates matters on the international arena and locally. And part of my very first priorities, if I am confirmed by the honorable members of this august house, would be to strengthen the capacity in that office. And by that I mean we have counsel who are very well trained and then they move on. We used to have that problem in the judiciary. We used to get the worst, so to speak, judicial officers who were rejected everywhere else. And the main reason for that was because we paid very poorly. The remuneration at the time of magistrates was pathetically low. Mr. Speaker, sir, if you compare the remuneration of the DPP's office, of the Anti-Corruption Commission, and you compare that with State Council at the Chambers of the Honorable the Attorney General, it's not comparable. Many officers have left, many moved to the judiciary, so the Chambers continue to train, but they move away. That is one very major problem. It is actually acute to the extent that council don't even have the basic tools, computers, a library, internet facilities, payment of per diems when they are required to go out of station. It sometimes takes over a year for them to be reimbursed with monies they have used from their own pocket because they feel they need to be at work. That is not fair and that must change. And I'll make it my business to change it. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, sir, we're now living, when I studied law, I mean, <laughs> these things didn't even exist. Now we have a spectrum of laws and areas which require very specialized training. Counsel at the chambers dealing with contracts of multi-million dollars without the competence of the drafting and other techniques that are required. Exposing them inevitably to influence by other quarters. 
that is an area and I'm aware you see corruption we talk about it chair but we need not just look at it in terms of the organs or the stakeholders who need to work together like I was saying earlier it's got to start with ourselves why does one take a bribe on a simple traffic matter because if I'm stopped I know it's going to take me the next week at Kibera and in that week my business is suffering Mr. Speaker, you know, we have got to the point where we've got to look at this at the national scale. My child goes to school and doesn't do so well at the end of primary school but because they are a child of a judge, they get into a national school they fail after high school they go into a university they fail they still get a degree certificate your recruit coming out of Kiganjo on his first job at the police station take those roadblocks what am I saying we have created a country where even our children believe in fraud because we have shown them that we can only succeed to be fraudulent. That won't work. So it then permeates into our lives the lives of advocates practicing at the bar the lives of raising mediocrity rather than merit when I was at the Kenya School of Law we had problems like there are today with the education of lawyers and my job at the time entailed single-handedly approving who was to resit what subjects that mystery still sh shrouds the training of our people so to come back to your question sir how well equipped are the people working in the state law office to ensure that the cases they defend in court whether the courts here or the courts at international arbitrations or like the Somali case you've just mentioned if we don't address it and address it quickly and adequately this country will continue Mr. Speaker to hemorrhage in different ways see uh, yeah, the voice of a lady and I, I'm aware that uh, Mwishimua Hassan is about to leave for some other function so let's see uh, let's, let's Question from um, Honorable Emanuel. Then you will allow me to <coughs> yeah, because I know the Honorable Hassan and requested that we allow him to to leave almost around this time to ask his question before he leaves. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, allow me to start by commendation uh, that uh, I, I I truly 
feel very impressed and inspired by the rich testimonials. Uh, and you, Justice uh, Kiara, you are an all-rounded man, uh, starting from religion, theater, law, um, underscoring family values, uh, being a visionary leader, leader because I've had you talk passionately about our future generations and how we need to shape them and um, also valuing um, diversity in our country. Uh, that is uh, truly what we need. At, at, at one point, I thought I was sitting in a church listening to a sermon and I was moved by, by what the values as Kenyans we should carry. Uh, Honorable Chair, <clears throat> I had a detailed question on the Solicitor General, but uh, the Minority Leader encroached on my question. <laughs> So I'll move to a different area <clears throat> uh, on uh, the disciplinary tribunal and service delivery. Uh, the advocates' the, uh, disciplinary tribunal is charged with the responsibility to hear cases of professional misconduct filed against advocates uh, investigated by the Advocates uh, Complaint Commission. Uh, th that commission is a division at the Office of the Attorney General and State Department of Justice. Uh, Justice Kiara, how do you see yourself contributing to improving this mechanism for enhanced uh, professional conduct by advocates? Thank you, Chair.